welcome back. So for the final part of this lecture, we're going to stop doing derivations and we're going to look at a little bit of material behaviour. We're going to relax the assumption that we've made about Newtonian behaviour, just a little bit, but relax it none the same. We're going to look at a class of fluids called generalised Newtonian fluids. This is a class of fluid where we allow the viscosity to vary in some way with the deformation rate. We, however, do retain the assumption that the state of stress is instantaneously linked to the deformation rate, so that implies there's no stress memory within the fluids. A lot of fluids do have stress memory, and we'll be discussing classes of fluids with stress memory later on in this course. We're going to look at the power law fluid. It's the simplest of the generalised Newtonian fluids, and we'll have a quick look at how values of parameters within the power law expression might be set for types of real fluid. We're also going to have a discussion surrounding generalised Newtonian fluids and describe why they're very useful. We'll explain problems which they're very good at solving, and we will highlight problems for which they shouldn't be used. Sometimes generalised Newtonian fluids can give us very good insight quickly and simply, and there's the key for an engineer, into certain types of fluid behaviour, where for other types of fluid behaviour it's really of no use for man and the beast. So we'll start off by looking at generalised Newtonian fluids and seeing what sort of viscosity relationships we might expect as a function of shear rate. So on the whiteboard in front of you I'm plotting a measure called apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. Now apparent viscosity is a viscosity that one would measure in a rheometer at a given shear rate. If you like, it's sort of an instantaneous viscosity, now that we acknowledge that viscosity can vary. The plot in blue there is a Newtonian fluid, and by definition, of course, that viscosity is constant. However, we can have fluids where the viscosity might increase with increasing shear rate. These are called shear thickening or dilatant fluids. An example of one would be a solution of cornstarch in water. As you deform it rapidly, it seemingly solidifies, and as soon as you stop deforming it, it returns to be quite watery again. So that's shear thickening or dilatancy. A far more common behaviour is shear thinning, where with deformation, the fluid viscosity drops. Sometimes, as shown on this plot, you have what's called a plateau, a low shear rate Newtonian plateau, where you have a quasi-constant viscosity prior to decreasing viscosity with increasing shear rate. Very, very common behaviour for suspensions of all sorts, suspensions of solids, suspensions of bubbles, polymer solutions, polymer melts, mostly all display shear thinning behaviour. So let's think what we can and can't do with this class of fluid, the generalised Newtonian fluids. They're very, very good at describing steady flow and deformation behaviour for a whole range of materials. Sometimes they can be used to predict pressure drop through equipment. So from an engineering standpoint, that's really important. It's quick and it's simple, or quicker and simpler to do that with a generalised Newtonian fluid than it is, for example, with a viscoelastic relationship. If you're worried about extrusion, shape processing materials, then sometimes you can use generalised Newtonian fluids to predict typically in computational fluid dynamics, the shape and form of a resulting extra date. There's some caveats that really have to be stated around this, but for certain ranges of materials, this is generally possible. The thing that allows us to use generalised Newtonian fluids is typically low levels of viscoelasticity, which is a phenomenon that we're dedicating part B of this rheology course to studying. So, if we think about fluids with viscoelasticity and the range of complex behaviour that these things can display, we see that we can't use generalised Newtonian fluids to describe them. So generalised Newtonian fluids, by definition, don't have any recollection of deformation. They have no memory, no stress memory. So any phenomena, typically processing instabilities that are linked in with stress memory, can't be predicted by generalised Newtonian fluids. For strongly viscoelastic materials, there is a high degree of memory of stress. 
and of course stress is inextricably linked with pressure drop in flow situations and so for very viscoelastic materials you'll find that generalized Newtonian models won't capture pressure drop very accurately at all. So for some engineering problems generalized Newtonian fluids are a very pragmatic choice to gain insight and understanding but their limitations are really um, apparent as soon as you start to look at more complex fluids that are highly viscoelastic. I'll give you an example of how a generalized Newtonian fluid can be very useful in an engineering context. So on the whiteboard in front of you there's a photograph. This photograph is of a cross-section of a piece of plastic tape with holes in it. This was something that I made with some colleagues during my PhD which is now a little while ago and the thing that really surprised us was the fact that these holes aren't circular because they were intended to be circular. The extrusion die that we made had circular holes in it. We were expecting a product, an extradate, with circular holes in it. But no, lo and behold, we've got beautiful diamond shapes instead. It's worth noting that these holes are very, very small. The corner to corner distance is around five or six hundred microns. So it's truly sort of a micro scale extrusion. We scratched our heads for quite some time to try and explain why we're getting diamond shaped holes. So we did a little bit of computer modelling and computer modelling is a very useful tool to gain insight into problems because you can select what type of physics you want the model to have in it and very often the type of physics the model has in it is a reduced set compared to the real world. So you can for example test whether Shear thinning is an important feature in what you see experimentally, or whether you need full viscoelasticity to explain what you're seeing. And we were thinking at this point in time that this surprising result, these diamond shaped holes with sharp edges, were viscoelastic in origin. However, no. On the whiteboard now, you'll see a computational prediction using a code called polyflow of the extrusion. The fluid properties that we programmed into the simulation were generalized Newtonian. No viscoelasticity, no stress memory, and an accurate representation of the extrusion geometry. And look, beautifully, the simulation captures what you see in the real world, even with that simplified set of physics. And so you can use the simulation to test what the dominant features are in determining an experimental result and in this case it's simply shear thinning. The circular injectors in this particular case were very very close to walls which meant that the material around those walls was subjected to very high shear rate which meant therefore that it had thinned substantially compared to the material that wasn't flowing near the walls and it was that that contributed to this rather wonderful shape. So, let's now have a look at the simplest possible generalized Newtonian constitutive equation. So, on the board in front of you, you'll see the stress relationship for a power law fluid. Remember, for a Newtonian fluid, tau equals mu times gamma dot, where mu is constant. Now we have tau equals k times gamma dot to the power n, hence why this is called a power law fluid. Now, K is something that we call a consistency index. It's a constant. It takes units of Pascal seconds to the power n because the shear rate measured in reciprocal seconds is raised to the power n. n is our power law index. Now, it's very useful sometimes to convert a, an expression that involves stress into an apparent viscosity. Now, remember that a viscosity mu is tau divided by gamma dot. So an apparent viscosity is a measure of stress divided by a measure of my shear rate. And so if we think about that in this case, my apparent viscosity, e to a, here highlighted in red, is my consistency index, k, times gamma dot raised to the power of n minus 1, because we've divided gamma dot to the power n by gamma dot. And so that, we can see now, gives us decreasing apparent viscosity with increasing shear rate so long as n is less than 1. Now the Newtonian result is revealed when n equals 1. 
If we substitute n equals 1 there, we have my apparent viscosity, eta a, is just k gamma dot. And k, my consistency index, becomes my viscosity. Now, as a point of note, it's very, very, very useful to know under what conditions a generalised Newtonian fluid model reverts back to being Newtonian again. Because when you've done two or three pages of algebra, some of which involving powers divided by powers, which is something that is very easy to make a simple error with, cross-checking your solution by setting, for example, n equals 1 and seeing whether you recover a Newtonian result is a very, very thorough error check. So let's now examine what the power law constitutive model predicts. I'm again plotting apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate, and the blue line there on the board is for my power law index n equals 1, which we know is a Newtonian fluid. So there we have a constant viscosity as a function of shear rate. Now, if n is greater than 1, we have dilatant behaviour, increasing apparent viscosity with increasing shear rate. We've already said if n is less than 1, we have shear thinning behaviour. Note that we don't have a plateau, but we do have decreasing apparent viscosity with increasing shear rate. So, let's think how we can use this, because it's kind of handy. If we have experimental data, we can use these plots to get values of our consistency index k and my power law index n, especially if we make a log plot, because log of e to a is log of k plus n minus 1 log of gamma dot. So suddenly looking at that straight line, if indeed you have a straight line, you can get the two parameters k and n very, very easily. Let's now have a look at real material behaviour and compare it to power law prediction. So again, on this graph on the whiteboard, I'm plotting apparent viscosity as a function of shear rate. And this is for a polymer melt. This is a real material, and we can see that at low shear rate, you have our Newtonian plateau, approximately 80 to 90 reciprocal se uh, Pascal seconds viscosity, up to a shear rate of about 0.5 reciprocal second. After that shear rate of about 0.5 reciprocal second, my apparent viscosity decreases with increasing shear rate, and it decreases by two orders of magnitude by the time our shear rate has increased by two orders of magnitude. This doesn't look like power law behaviour, does it? If we superimpose power law behaviour onto this, we can see that we can make it fit the shear thinning region, but there's a gross overprediction of viscosity in that plateau region. And if we think mathematically what happens if we reduce shear rate to zero, the power law expression actually ends up with a division by zero for shear thinning. <clears throat> and that, that is a bad thing computationally or in any analytical calculation. So we have to be careful with power law models. If we're using a power law model to predict pressure drop, because the maths is very easy to do so, we have to match the shear rate range of the equipment that's producing that pressure drop to the use of the power law model. So for example, if we have some processing machinery, which typically has shear rates of 10 reciprocal second or more, we can quite comfortably use the power law model, which is good because there's very simple expressions for pressure drop, for wall shear rate, for velocity field, and for measures of heat and mass transfer. And so being able to say, well, this region is valid, is actually a very powerful engineering statement. However, if our processing machinery typically may be reached up to one reciprocal second, we can clearly see that the power law model will lead to gross error. And we need a more advanced generalised Newtonian model to capture that Newtonian plateau. So remember the range of applicability. So it's always a good idea in any subject to have a rough feel of the general order of magnitude for certain parameters. So on the whiteboard in front of you, I've put a list of power law indices for typical fluids. So low molecular mass polymers, typically quite, quite Newtonian really, so n would be 1. If we're thinking polymer processing, most polymer melts will have power law indices between about 0.4 and 0.8. They'll shear thin, fairly substantially, but reasonably. As we increase molecular mass, then 
our power law index diminishes and suddenly materials become very, very shear thinning indeed. And so that's a typical range of power law index for grades of, for example, um, plastics. Let's now recall some key points. We've introduced now the concept of a generalised Newtonian fluid, of which the power law fluid is an example. The generalised Newtonian fluid has a non-constant viscosity, but it still does not have stress memory. And we link that variable viscosity in some way to the deformation rate. The power law fluid is a very simple example of a generalised Newtonian fluid. And we can see that the stress is equal to my consistency index K, multiplied by my shear rate gamma dot raised to the power n, and n is my power law index. We can infer an apparent viscosity from this, which is k gamma dot to the n minus 1. And we can see that if we look at the relationship between my apparent viscosity and my deformation rate gamma dot, we get shear thinning behaviour for n being less than 1, shear thickening behaviour for n is greater than 1, and Newtonian behaviour for when n equals 1. And we said that n equals 1 is a very important sanity check that you can make if you're doing long, complex calculations and you need to check whether you've made any errors or not. We've also discussed range of applicability, not only for the power law model, but also in more general terms for generalised Newtonian fluids, what they can describe, what they can't describe.